It was almost dangerous. You lose sight of the fact that it's a vacuum out there, and if you spring a leak next to it, you're going to be dead. Uh oh. It's the brightest and most noticeable object in the night sky. But if you spend much time observing it, you will see that the moon is never quite the same from one night to the next. The moon has something we call phases, which means that it appears to change shape a little bit every night. To understand why this happens, we need to talk a little bit about the way the Earth and the moon move together in space. The moon orbits around the Earth, much like the Earth orbits around the sun. However, while the Earth takes about 365 days to travel once around the Sun, one year, the Moon completes its orbit around the Earth in only 29 and a half days, or about one month. Just like the Earth, the Moon has a day side and a night side, with half of it in sunlight and half of it in darkness at any one time. As the Moon travels through its orbit around the Earth, that dividing line between day and night, called the Terminator, is visible from different angles giving the impression that different amounts of the moon are lit up on different days. We always see the same old side of the moon because the moon rotates exactly once on its axis each time it orbits Earth. If it weren't spinning at all, we'd get at least one 360-degree view of its surface with each lap. If we're spinning twice as fast, we'd also see the moon's entire surface more than once per orbit. But instead, our moon's motions, like the spin and orbit of most other moons in our solar system, are remarkably in perfect sync. We always see the same old side of the moon because the moon rotates exactly once on its axis each time it orbits Earth. Check this out. The moon is rotating, right? Look at the line, if you don't believe me. Vertical, horizontal, mm -hmm. right? But it's rotating at a rate that matches the revolution. Just so, so that only one side of the moon ever faces Earth. And that's exactly the situation we find ourselves in today. The only side we ever see, we call the near side. The side we don't ever see, we call the far side. The moon can only rotate so fast because Earth won't let it do otherwise. As a consequence, the moon rotates only once for every revolution, and only one side of the moon ever faces us.
of the main defenses that people make to show or argue that we had to have gone to the moon. And they often say that there would have been so many people involved in the conspiracy, it would have been impossible to keep it quiet. The only people who would have known about the hoax would have been those on a need-to-know basis. And that would have been very few people. You have your astronauts, you have the people filming everything and building the locations, and you have the people authorizing it, and that's it. Everybody else would have been doing their one task in the line and sequence of events that they were responsible for. And this segues into another defense made by people who believe we went to the moon, and that is, why didn't NASA have them do things over after they made mistakes? And the reason for that is that this was live, and not everybody was in on it. And those hundreds of people you see at Mission Control, they're not in on it. You got the surgeons, they're monitoring the heart rate. You have the data guys, they're monitoring whatever is coming in on their feed. And everybody is looking at a live event and all over the world people are monitoring a live event. So there were no do-overs. Going back to what John Young said, by way of illustration about the photo guys, the photo guys would have received the film. The film couldn't be developed on the moon. It had a chain of custody. That had to take place, and those guys were not in on it. So what has just happened to cause this stain pattern to emerge? The answer is orange juice. It has been well documented that the astronauts had a problem with the suction straws inside their helmets that allowed them to take sips of orange juice. The straws would accidentally squirt orange juice all over them and into their helmets and this was a big problem on the mission and the orange juice actually seeped into the neck ring and it appears obvious now that the orange juice leaked through the neck ring at station 9 and caused the camera to be stained and that is direct evidence that they could not possibly be on the moon because if orange juice could leak through the helmet lock then the helmet lock was not properly sealed to protect the astronauts from the vacuum of space and this is because the helmet and the neck ring in order to be airtight must also have been watertight because water molecules are bigger than air molecules so if water escaped then oxygen also escaped and the suit would not have been pressurized and in that case the astronauts would be dead Now, I am not the first to suggest there's some sort of Geppetto character in the rafters above pulling the astronauts by some sort of harness with fishing wire. Like, why does Charlie Duke want John Young to push on his head here? Uh, oops, here I go again. Give me a help. There you go. Okay, just push, start pushing on my head. So he pushes down on his head and his feet seem to levitate backwards. You see, the vibration of my voice box makes the air vibrate between us. Then when the air vibrates your eardrum, you hear what I'm saying. But maybe you've seen a demonstration of a bell under a glass jar. With normal air inside the jar, you could hear the bell clearly. But when the vacuum pump drew the air out of the jar, there was nothing inside to carry the vibrations of the bell. Nothing until the air was let back into the jar. They can't see your uh, photo numbers. And this is clear tube number two. Okay, this is the fact that almost dried it without a hammer. But if you hand it to me, I'll get it in a second. I'm going to take a couple more shots of this before we leave. Get all in, I get the pictures. All right? The sounds in space, um, it's odd to 
have a hammer or a metal tool and bang it against something and hear absolutely nothing. You can, you know, sound won't travel in the vacuum, so there you are outside and you could be hitting something, no sound at all. In space, since there's no, uh, there's no atmosphere, there's no air, mm -hmm. if you bang on something while you're doing your spacewalk, you will not be able to hear that. And this leads us to the dilemma of our final segment. All modern astronauts, such as Piers Sellers and Mike Massimino, claim to hear absolutely nothing when they're out on the International Space Station in the vacuum, banging away with metal tools and objects, whereas during the Apollo missions, all kinds of sounds have been recorded that should not be possible if they are on the moon in the vacuum of space. Even when the astronaut in the photo to the right hit a metal tube into the ground with a hammer, no sound was made. All of the sounds so far analyzed were made by the astronauts as they were handling tools, but now we are going to analyze some sounds that are made a distance away from the astronauts. So what you just saw appears to be a smoking gun. That scene, which was broadcast live to the world during Apollo 15, shows astronaut James Irwin. He takes this cord or band off of a canister and those canisters are in the mesa table, which Irwin is standing in front of. He unravels the cord which has two metallic locks at the end of it, pictured here. They look like bullets. He takes that off, he unravels it, he reaches back with his right hand, and he throws the cord away. Let's take another look at it. So the argument has been made for the hammering that the sound is coming through the glove and it's miraculously getting into the microphones. But we don't have to deal with that argument because James Irwin releases the object and it hits the ship and he's not touching it and that sound is picked up by the microphone. The command module would be traveling at 25,000 miles per hour when it hit the upper atmosphere. If you travel down the highway 
you're traveling at 60 miles per hour, you're traveling at 88 feet per second. We're coming in at 36,000 feet per second. It smashes into the atmosphere. It doesn't fly as much as wah, smash. To protect the capsule, the engineers had built the largest heat shield ever. Re-entering the Earth's atmosphere is dangerous because of the enormous heat it causes. The heat shield protects the command module for several minutes as it passes through the atmosphere. Down below, an aircraft carrier waits for the astronaut's arrival. Once we get about two miles above the surface, the parachutes are deployed to slow us down even more. The hard part is over. Now we just enjoy the ride. The final part of every mission, splashdown.
to stronger amplification of television signals by today's satellites, consumers can now receive broadcasts directly on 18-inch wide dishes. As improvements continue, these satellite receivers may become an integral part of most households, providing 400 channels of incoming television and data, as well as one channel of outgoing video. Communication satellites have transformed our world into a global village in less than four decades. Today we can pick up the phone and instantly talk to someone else almost anywhere on the planet. Or turn on our televisions and watch foreign and domestic events unfold before our eyes. International faxing, high-speed modems, and email using phone lines and satellites also allow businesses, researchers, and ordinary people to transmit data around the globe in a matter of seconds. Real-time worldwide communications was something that didn't exist before the 1960s in the communication satellite revolution that has changed our whole way of life. Our whole society, our economy uh, is built on those capabilities.